Welcome to the Jero's Health Podcast, where we make it easy for you to better serve older adults through our content that informs, community that inspires, and courses that deliver. Hey, welcome to the Jero's Health Podcast, where we make it easy for you to better serve older adults. I'm your host, Nicole Nexon, and this is the State of the Sniff. In this week's episode, we're going to discuss osteoporosis and how we can influence it in a skilled nursing facility. Before we get into some ideas about how to address osteoporosis, I want to look at prevalence. According to the National Institutes of Health, one in three women or one in five men over the age of 50 will experience osteoporotic fractures, and this is worldwide. So that's about 200 million people, and in the U.S. alone, we're looking at about 44 million people. So if you are in a skilled nursing facility, you are going to see osteoporosis. A working definition of osteoporosis I'm going to take from the World Health Organization, and what they're looking at is bone mineral density. After the age of 50, according to the World Health Organization, a normal bone mineral density score, which is a T-score, should be greater than negative 1.0. Low bone mass, which has historically been called osteopenia, is in a range between negative 1.0 to negative 2.5, and a T-score greater than negative 2.5 would be considered osteoporosis. Again, that is after the age of 50. Now, under the age of 50, the World Health Organization has us look at a different score, and these are Z-scores. A Z-score of less than negative 2.0 would be within the expected range, again, for somebody under 50, whereas a score greater than negative 2.0 is below the range and would be considered osteoporotic, again, The Z-scores are looking at people younger than 50. The T-scores are looking at adults older than 50. And I'm going to give you some risk factors as well. So primary risk factors, um, and these are considered age-related changes, would be over the age of 65, female, history of vertebral compression fracture, or a fracture with minimal or no causative trauma after the age of 40. Family history of osteoporotic fracture, especially a parental hip fracture, low vitamin D and low dietary calcium intake, excessive alcohol consumption, smoking, postmenopausal body weight below 132 pounds, which is 60 kilograms, and or present body weight more than 10% below body weight at age 25. And that's like a bit twisted, so let me repeat that. Postmenopausal body weight below 132 pounds, which is 60 kilograms. Now, some of us are smaller, so what we're looking at there could also be present body weight more than 10% below the body weight at age 25. Some other factors that could influence bone mineral density and bone fragility specifically, and this is sometimes called secondary osteoporosis, would be primary hyperparathyroidism, hypogonadism. So if you are not producing enough um, testosterone or estrogen, use of medication that may cause bone loss. And some of those examples are dilantin, heparin, excess thyroid hormone, and prednisone. So common medications again. Medical conditions that directly cause or affect nutrient absorption. So some of those we can look at are rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, cancer and chemotherapy, chronic liver disease, and chronic kidney disease. So I hope in that list you heard a lot of places where PTs can intervene, right? We can, you know, help them understand their medications. We can help discuss dietary issues or direct to somebody who would have 
a better ability to help manage dietary issues. We can discuss smoking cessation. We can direct to other services if they are having issues with alcohol or other drugs. But the real places that we can help and what's been highlighted are three things. Bone preservation, fall prevention, and fracture prevention. So when we talk about bone preservation, we are discussing mixed or varied loading. When we say fall prevention, I want you all to remember that that is balance and strengthening, not just balance activities alone. And fracture prevention, under fracture prevention, we can also talk about post-fracture management. I want to highlight our Facebook group for a minute because there's some really awesome stuff that comes out of there. And what I want to talk about in our discussion on osteoporosis is something called the National Osteoporosis Society, or it was called the National Osteoporosis Society. It is now called the Royal Osteoporosis Society. So you guessed it. It's not an American thing. It's actually from the UK. And they published a guide that I really like using with patients because they made specific patient-friendly things. And the whole thing is really simply set up to make it memorable and to really help create confidence in a population that has been told that they shouldn't move and they shouldn't lift and they need to be careful and they're going to fracture. So what their guide is called is Strong, Steady, and Straight. And it is a physical activity and exercise guide for osteoporosis. So I want to talk you through how this strong, steady, and straight guide meshes very nicely, actually perfectly, with what we were discussing previously as the physical therapist's role in addressing osteoporosis. All right, so we discussed bone preservation, and that is mixed and varied, mixed or varied loading, right? So when we look at when they say strong, strong is when they're talking about preservation of bone. Right? They're talking about the types and amount of physical exercise and physical activity needed to promote bone strength. So all the recommendations under the strong category are working on bone preservation, mixed and or varied load. We then talked about fall prevention, and that is a combination of balance and strengthening, and that is what they call steady. Steady activities Look at the importance of including exercise and physical activity to reduce falls and the resulting fractures. So we're looking at bone preservation, we're looking at fall prevention in ways that are well packaged for patients and for us to teach patients. The last piece of the puzzle we had talked about initially was fracture prevention and post-fracture management. And this falls under their category of straight. So straight is a focus on spine care. It is, and what I really like was, it's a positive approach to bending, moving, and lifting to reduce the risk of vertebral fracture, to improve posture, and relieve pain after vertebral fracture. And I love that they really focus on keeping it positive. Like this whole setup, like I said, is really patient-friendly. We're not looking at scare tactics here anymore. We're looking at ways to help people who need to address a medical condition reframe in a way that makes them feel confident and able. And that's what we're all about, right? Reducing kinesophobia, increasing movement, increasing confidence, and restoring quality of life. And in that vein of avoiding kinesophobia, I want to talk about, they look at safety, and but they look at key principles. And one of their biggest highlighted key principles is professionals should avoid restricting physical activity and exercise unnecessarily according to bone mineral density. This is not saying don't look at a comprehensive picture and don't make safe recommendations. It is saying things we've said in a lot of other episodes on this podcast and a lot of other discussions in our group. Don't inspire fear. Don't be afraid to move your patients and don't have your patients be afraid to move. Fear of weights and fear of moving is actually going to further the impact of the osteoporosis and lead to a higher risk for falls 
and a higher risk for morbidity down the road than keeping them moving safely is ever going to do. There's another point. People with osteoporosis should be encouraged to do more rather than less. Encourage a how-to rather than a don't do. And that people who have had fractures need clear and prompt guidance on how to adapt movements and exercises so they can continue, right? We all know cycle of decline, PJ paralysis, all the big fancy things that tell us that not moving is bad apply here. Not moving is really bad for these people. All right, so I've gone off on my tangent about kinesiophobia is bad and we all know that. So let's look at some of the recommended activities and then discuss how that would look in the SNP. Okay, so strong. Build bone and muscle strength. So they're saying weight-bearing impact exercises for bones. The frequency of this is most days. With osteoporosis, they give you some moderate impact ideas. They give you some lower impact ideas and some really low um, impact ideas with weight-bearing. Here's the thing. Get standing as soon as your patients can. Standing. Even if you just have them standing to stand. Stand with one hand on the walker. Stand with both hands on the walker. Start with two hands on the walker. Work on getting one hand on the walker and punching forward or punching up or whatever their movement allows with the other. Slowly incorporate to maybe standing unsupported with a small task progress to dynamic standing and walking as possible, progress to stepping exercises, all of these things. Because some of their daily activities are carrying bags, bringing out the trash, gardening, vacuuming, right? So these are all important things that you can do. Look at what your patient's needs are and think, can I adapt this into a standing position? If you can't, that's fine. If it's safe for them to sit, sometimes you got to start sitting. But if you can get them in standing, go for it. Steady. They're saying this is two to three days per week. Um, they're saying a challenging balance class or Tai Chi dance. So we're talking about like yoga and sitting tasks. Again, how can you encourage your patients to be up and standing, and how can you challenge their balance? There's so many options in the skilled nursing facility, and if you are going to challenge their balance, personally, I make sure I have a gait belt, and I make sure I have an aid with me if I'm afraid that somebody is going to fall. It's not that I don't do it. I set it up as safely as possible. Nine times out of ten, your patient is going to be afraid. So this is on you to build that patient-therapist relationship where you can say to them, I'm not going to put you in an unsafe situation. I'm not going to ask you to do things you're not capable of. And the more buy-in you get, the more you're willing to listen to them, the better you build that alliance, the more, the more they're going to trust you, but also put in those safety methods. Have an extra set of hands, either hands-on or nearby. Have a gate belt on them. Have the walker right in front of them so that they can grab it if they need to. Do your exercises inside the parallel bars. Start with one hand support and then move away. All things we need to look at. And finally, straight. So we're going to improve pain and posture and movements. So again, avoid inactivity or prolonged sitting. And you want to avoid extreme or loaded flexion. I wish you guys could see this handout I'm looking at right now because there are some seriously crazy pictures they have people in. I mean, there's like a, you know, if you're familiar with yoga, there's boat pose and there's regular sit-ups, but, um, you know, forward folds. And there's one with somebody laying on their back with their feet over their head, which, I mean, if you can get there, it feels great, but I'm not about to put any of my patients in that position, like the load on their 
cervical spine, youch. So much flexion in there. Um, one of the things also in this picture is they do show somebody lying prone. Um, there are a lot of people, especially that I see in the skilled nursing facility, who don't like to lay on their belly, but I always try to offer it. Um, and if they cannot lay on their belly, I will kind of do activities where they're um, putting some weight bearing through their arms or they're in a position where they kind of have to work up a little bit straighter. Maybe they're standing and there is like a, we have a mirror and there's Velcro on the back of it. We can kind of stick stuff on it and make them work on like some reaching tasks and some looking. Um, also rows, you know, one of the pictures on here is somebody just doing a seated row with a TheraBand. I'm, I mean, yeah, you know, so look at your postural activities and pull those in here. Posture can, can change, you know, like they didn't get to that flex position overnight and they're not going to come out of it overnight, but there is so much that you can do because we all know that flexion increases the likelihood of vertebral fracture, right? Compression fractures. And I mean, probably what, eight out of 10 of my patients have some kind of flexed posture when they're standing. So they're already putting themselves in a position where they're more likely to have a compression fracture. And the people who have had compression fractures already, like they're just doubly so. I mean, don't quote me on the doubly. That's just my words. That's not actual fact. Anyway, I digress again. Tangents. The big takeaway that I want you to get from this is stop promoting fear of movement. Do not be afraid yourself to have these patients do activities. We know they need to load their bones, right? We know that we are working on bone preservation. So we know we're looking at loading. Bam. First thing, don't be afraid. Be smart. Don't be afraid. Fall prevention, which is balance activities and strengthening. You need those two key pieces to prevent falls. That's what all the studies have been shown. Fracture prevention and post-fracture management, and a lot of that is positioning, spinal alignment, getting them upright, getting them straight, avoiding sitting. All right, so we're all going to go forward from here. We're not going to be afraid to exercise our patients with osteoporosis. I mean, there is so much you can do in the SNF. If you are seeing these people every day, I see most of my people five days a week. I know that's a very common schedule for your med A patients. Take a peek at this. Go to the Royal Osteoporosis Society. And I mean, it is so visual and such a good place to start getting ideas. Um, PT Now on the APTA website has a bunch of ideas also. I never want to discredit that. And I want you all to look there. And again, pop into the Facebook group because we have great stuff going on. Um, thanks so much for listening. It's been great. And I hope that I've helped you at least plant some ideas in your head so that you can move forward. Have a great week. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Jaros Health Podcast. Go to jaroshealth.com to get the show notes for this episode and find out how you can join the Jaros community for free. You'll get access to our private Facebook group and the weekly Jaros Recap where we share our favorite reads, podcasts, and any interesting conversations in the Jaros community that week. Once again, that's G-E-R-O-S health.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.